Okay, so with that, cool. I'm going to turn it over to Pat. Awesome. Did, you Did I set you up? Absolutely. Well, the questions Perfect. were, so the question, come on, Pat. Yep, yep, yep. So <laughs> when we've been dialoguing about what to ask the experts, Pat agreed to be our, our, our first expert. And I was trying to say, it's not, we're not asking you, Pat, to make us experts in what you know. Mm -hmm. But what we're asking you is to help us understand what are the, so the critical attributes of these processes. What makes yes. lean good? For lead, not in instructional design. Yes, yes, yes. What makes Agile really good in what it's ever used for? Right? Right. And then once you say this is why, why is it good? So what right. is good about it? And then why? It's you know, and I'll just make up it's fast, it's this, it's that. And then we want to make the bridge to how could that therefore be used in instructional design? Right. So that's the question to you. What are the well, key essential essence of each of these processes you're going to talk about? Mm -hmm. What are the attributes that might be attributed or use an instructional design. Mm -hmm. Cool. Is that a, is that, that a fair that direction? Excellent. Is that a talk? Okay. Good <laughs> luck. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you want to do your slide? Um, yeah, I can. Um, I'll, as I'm setting this up, let me um, address Lance's question. Um, basically, Lance shared with us a little bit about um, the, the challenge. One thing he invited you to do, and I'd like to echo that invitation, is you have the opportunity here to head into an entirely new frontier, an entirely new territory by applying Agile and Lean and the concepts that we covered tonight to an area that, that is totally uncharted. As Lance mentioned, you won't see any real roadmaps or instructional design playbooks of how to apply Agile and Lean. So we're inviting you tonight uh, to kind of open your mind to maybe changing the way you think. As Lance was sharing a uh, comparison of Addy and an invitation to really think a little bit differently, you know, it, it struck a chord with me in terms of where Agile came from in the first place. It emerged out of the lack of waterfall development processes being sufficient to meet the demands of the day. And the parallels between Addy in terms of its, its origin and waterfall methodology is, is profound. So what we have to do with Agile is we have to actually start by changing our mindset. So I'm kind of skirting around Lance's question just to do a little bit of a setup to invite you to kind of open your minds and maybe think about things a little bit differently tonight because that's what it's going to actually take to discover where you can and how you can use Agile and Lean to effectively deal with the dynamics of change that Susan was telling us in terms of her experience you know, to your competitive advantage and radically change the way you think about instructional design. You know, it's not just an, a little tool change or a little thought change. It's really quite a radical change. Now I'll kind of address Lance's question point blank and then jump into a deeper dive, you know, kind of setting you up for the hands-on experience this, uh, this evening, okay? Um, bottom line, lean. Lance had asked, what does it stand for? It's not an acronym. It doesn't stand for anything else except lean. And the essence of lean is pushing waste out of the system. You know, um, as systems emerge, you're probably familiar with the fact that there's a lot of waste that actually crops into systems. The people who actually initiated lean um, assume there's as much as 95% waste in the systems that we engage in on a daily basis. And that would include instructional design, you know, traditional instructional design. Um, so lean is really about eliminating waste and optimizing the value stream. It introduces a focus on customers, and it introduces the concept of instead of those siloed territories that kind of emerged at the same time Addy was emerging, you know, lean takes a look at the end-to-end -end concept to cash or from idea to delighting a customer, you know, and tries to actually eliminate waste every step of the way along that value stream. And it uses tools called, one of the primary tools in Lean is called value stream mapping, where you actually expose the waste. Once you expose the greatest waste that's in that value stream between the idea and the end product of your instructional design, you know, you amplify and elevate that constraint, it's called. You amplify that source, that bottleneck, that, that blocker that actually prohibits value from being flowing very smoothly through that value chain, exposes it, enables you to do something about it, 
and you get continuously better and better, you know, as you optimize the value stream and improve, kind of push the waste out of the system, and hence the word lean, right? Because you're moving that waste out, you're flushing it out of the system, and you're optimizing it. You're kind of making it a lean and mean kind of value machine, as opposed to, you know, allowing all that waste to just sort of accumulate. So that's kind of the essence of lean. Razor-like focus on customer value and amplifying value to the customer by eliminating waste, introducing the concept of pull, pulling value through the system, you know, and exposing the waste that's in the system to continuously get better and better and better. Does that make sense? Kind of at a high level. Now, Agile emerged out of Lean. Lean actually started back in the day of Henry Ford. You know, it's getting better and better and has really been amplified with the Toyota production system. When Toyota discovered that out of necessity, they really needed to do something radically different, you know, and they implemented it, really made famous um, the work of Lean, which has then been picked up in manufacturing and has emerged to kind of uh, uh, influence all industries. Now, Agile emerged out of the Lean movement, and it is in response to the, the fact that most software development processes, most software development projects are very, very complicated, and they're no longer served by that heavy methodology of waterfall where you do all the upfront analysis and before you even start to do the design, you get sign off and lock down and try to control the requirements up front so that they don't change. You know, that's the spirit of waterfall, the old waterfall methodology um, that Agile actually emerged to, to solve the problems that emerged out of that, right? The waterfall model in software development is very, very, very much like the ADI model for instructional design. Do all the upfront analysis, do the design, then you do the development, then you do the testing, then you roll it out to the customer, and you discover it's not what they wanted in the first place. You know, so that's that's basically how Agile emerged. And it, it emerged about 11 years ago from a group of concerned luminaries who discovered, who were really frustrated by the constraints that, were, that everybody was facing and the fact that nobody was doing anything about it. We were still stuck in waterfall. Royce, uh, the guy who invented waterfall in 76, never intended for it to be codified you know, uh, and standardized, but it, it became so, and it was actually detrimental to the entire industry. So Agile not only revolutionized the software development industry, but Agile has now expanded way beyond <coughs> software engineering to all kinds of other domains, most uh, prominently marketing, but uh, also has been introduced into the legal system, architecture, you know, and hopefully with Lance and my invitation to instructional design, because I'm confident that you will see the potential benefits. And I've put a couple slides together to really kind of reinforce some of this, the uh, message that I've kind of given you uh, an executive summary on. But also, um, I'm, I'd be happy to share um, how I apply Agile and Lean to all the, um, the courseware, the courses, courses that I develop. I teach an Agile management program, a certification program for UC Berkeley on the weekends that I design, and I do all my own content development. I wouldn't call myself a professional instructional designer, but I, have, I do develop all of my learning content um, for the, uh, the academic, for the university, and I think you might be very surprised uh, when I share with you exactly the process that I go through to develop that. Um, using very much the lean concepts and using Agile, you know, I allow learning to be pulled from the customer, the students who are in my class, and actually emerge in the learning experience. So we can talk a little bit about that later, but first um, I'll buzz very quickly through kind of reinforcing the, the, uh, the high level summary I just gave you about what is Agile and what is Lean, you know, and then we'll take, have a chance for you to ask questions and then start to apply what it is um, that you're learning about in terms of the high-level summary of what Agile and Lean is. Any questions or anything that you want to make sure we cover before I jump into this? Make sense so far? Cool. I'll go pre pretty quickly through this and you will have a copy of these slides, you know, so, um, so I'm going to buzz right through it. If I'm going too fast, let me know. If I'm going too slow, let me know as well. Um, quick summary, a uh, little summary about who I am, uh, in addition to, to what Susan mentioned. 
I've been um, applying Agile and Lean and Six Sigma. I introduced Six Sigma to Universal Studios. I introduced Total Quality Management to Disney a number of years ago. Um, for the past eight and a half years, I was leading uh, software development, Agile transformations at The Gap. Um, you're probably familiar with uh, The Gap being in San Francisco, where I led IT strategy, um, IT finance, portfolio management, release management, and the Agile transformation. Uh, before that, I spent 20 years in the entertainment business, very fast-paced industry, motion picture production, and a lot of the concepts of Agile actually emerged from Disney, you know, um, as they were making motion picture production, particularly feature animation. I supported the feature animation, I supported ABC at Disney, NBC at Universal Studios, um, so I was in the entertainment industry for the past 20 years before I came up uh, to work at Gap. And before that, surprisingly, I was in criminal intelligence forensic systems at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, which is Colorado's FBI, um, and applied, um, Lance and I have artificial intelligence as a, as a consistency in our background. You know, I used artificial intelligence to design forensic solutions for the CBI and the FBI, and worked a little bit with the department uh, in uh, California as well. So before I started my own company, um, launching um, Agile Consulting and helping large-scale organizations transform, um, I've been a practitioner my entire life, um, mostly in uh, applying technology to solve business problems, and have used Agile and have been Agile. Um, I've also been an instructor, starting my career, my academic career at the University of Denver uh, many, many years ago in the 70s, have been teaching the entire time I've been working in these corporations as an adjunct professor. And that's where I um, kind of just dipped my toe into instructional design because I always developed my own course content um, for whatever courses I was teaching. There were always courses that I sort of wrote and uh, developed content for. So that's the extent of my experience with, um, with instructional design. So um, Agile, um, we're going to just briefly go over this. I'm going to time box myself to say 15 minutes because that's where the maximum learning story that I do when I ever teach in an academic setting is 15 minutes. Um, I'm confident that you're going to get totally bored if I talk any longer than that. So Agile, in the words of Jim Highsmith, who's one of the founding fathers of Agile, is really about the ability to both create and respond to change in order to profit in a highly turbulent environment. And Susan was talking about the, the extreme change that she was challenged with in her current uh, challenges. And Lance talked a lot about the fact that all of us are in probably working under conditions of whitewater change. And that's what Agile is all about. Agile is about being able to leverage and build your competitive edge in being comfortable when everybody else has experienced that duck and cover deer in the headlights kind of you know, experience that most of us react to when we run into change, right? We're dealing with extreme change. It's uncomfortable. You don't know what to do. You pretty, a lot of people just naturally duck and cover you know, and hope that it passes. You know, as Lance was sharing, it's not going to pass. It's never going to pass. So Jim uh, indicates that if we really want to use Agile and we really want to be Agile, we actually change our mindset to welcome change, to get uncomfortable with being uncomfortable, to give ourselves that competitive edge and say, I know how to deal with this, you know, where our competition doesn't. And that then buffers you from the, you know, tensions and the friction and all the negative things that accompany your resistance to change, um, giving you that competitive edge. So it's really about a set of values, principles, and best practices. And even more importantly, it's about a mindset change a different way of thinking that enables you to embrace change and to give up the delusion of being able to control change. As we talked about in, that, in the waterfall world, we assume that if we locked everything down and froze change so that there's no way our customer could ever change their mind on anything, we would succeed. You know, that quite honestly in today's business pace and volatile business environment, times of great uncertainty, is truly a delusion. You know, we are not going to delight the customer if we think we're going to freeze change and not give them what they really need because they didn't tell us or we didn't understand it back at the beginning when we when we locked down those requirements. Does it make sense? 
So instead, what we're focusing on in Agile and Lean is embracing change, welcoming it actually, enabling the customer to change their mind up to the last responsible moment, and then we'll discover and co-create what they really want you know, in, in order to delight the customer. That's the essence of Agile, and that's the essence of Lean. And the bottom line is Agile really does require a mindset or paradigm shift, hence the invitation that we offered you tonight to really kind of challenge that. We're going to talk tonight um, more about being Agile than doing Agile. You know, because as instructional designers facing this whole new territory, you're going to actually have to let, learn to become Agile first as you do Agile. You learn through doing, not thinking. You'll never think your way into a new way of, of doing, but you have to do your way kind of into a new way of thinking. So, oops, sorry, wrong direction. Why do companies embrace Agile? Why do most of us even consider Agile? This is from a new version one um, and survey that was done every year. Most companies uh, in the Bay Area, for sure, you're in the, in the kind of, you're in the, um, you're in a hotbed of Agile right now in the Silicon Valley, so it's absolutely natural that your addressing and applying Agile makes perfect sense. I don't, I don't know of a single, yes, go ahead. I'd just like to add to that, it's, yes. it's, they often call it innovation in a lot yes. of these companies as they, they look at why they want to be Agile is to lead to be more innovative. Yes. And so even though that's their product they want to deliver to their customers, yes. I think it fits very lock and step with what you're saying we, you have to deliver to them. Exactly. In fact, great point. You know, it's about that disruptive innovation that you usually find you delight your customer, right? Look at Apple. You know, Apple wasn't waiting for some customer to say, I want an iPod, you know, or I want an iPad, or I want this or that. Uh, you know, they actually uh, got ahead of that change curve, disruptive innovation. You know, and Agile is kind of well-known and renowned for doing that. So great observation, right? As part of that competitive advantage, not only is it our ability to uh, deal with change, but we welcome it through disruptive innovation. That's a great example of Jim's quote of actually creating change to your advantage, right? Creating a new way of thinking about instructional design, you know, to build a competitive edge and give customers what they don't even know they need yet, you know, to get ahead of the change curve. Because they're still struggling with the deer in the headlights syndrome, you know, not really being able to um, to really think in an agile way. So we're inviting you to embrace agile as a way of thinking, you know, and finding that disruptive innovation and ways to uh, work a little better. So at the heart of agile is learning, at the heart of lean is learning and disruptive change to the benefit of the customer. The customer focus is the essence, customer value and generating customer value is the essence. Quality comes along with it because quality is our fastest path to sustainable value. We can't shortcut quality, because in the long run, we won't have sustainable Agile. So these are just examples, and again, we'll leave you with these slides. The Agile Manifesto is a fairly famous event that happened at Sunbird in Utah, where these luminaries got together, and they decided they were going to do a better way of software development, just as you might be deciding you might be doing a better way of instructional design. And at the heart of it, they put individuals and interactions over people. Lance had mentioned tonight that it really is going to take all of us or a collaborative effort to come up with a radical new way of doing instructional design. So it's individuals and interactions, collaborative interactions over process. Think about that for a second. What, what, we're not saying that there is no value of process, but people trump process every time when you're dealing with rapid change. Because the process, if it's been too hardened down, it actually gets in our way, right? So we actually elevate um, people over process. Working, let's call that working products over comprehensive documentation, right? We're all about creating value for the customer, and that means create the product as rapidly as you can, you know, to delight the customer or learn. There's a concept in Agile, <coughs> which is also called fail fast to succeed sooner. And the comment that you had about disruptive innovation, you can't get there from here if you're fearful of, of uh, failure. You know, you have to be bold and actually embrace the concept of failure if you're really gonna create that disruptive innovation. You know, so fail fast to succeed sooner is a practice yeah. in Agile. Yeah, yes. so this is, this is great. Yes. I, so, because I'm not gonna be here at the end, yes, I'd yes. love for you to put this slide up yes. towards the end and have the group put that in learning terms. Because I'm awesome. sitting here going, how would you, because that to me would be the essence of what we're trying to get at. 
Awesome. Does everybody understand? Like yeah, I'm reading yeah. this and thinking, well, instead of working software, it would be you know, working learning solutions exactly. over comprehensive analysis documents. Or, exactly. or are you following me where I'm going, Pat? Oh, I totally follow you. Okay, so we're all in line then. Totally. We okay, actually good. are completely in line. Okay, good. There. I just want to make sure because I'm not going to be here for the end. So okay, I want to make sure cool. you're, we're in and line. Sort of to accept Lance's invitation then, wouldn't it be cool if you guys write the Agile Manifesto for in Instructional Design? Yes. Yeah? And then actually use that as a launch pad you know, for taking off into this kind of bold new territory. So thank you for that, Lance. Customer collaboration and responding to change over following a plan. Again, in times of rapid whitewater change, you know, it's the planning that's important, not the plan, because you know the plan's going to change faster than you actually can. As you, if you're following the plan, it's like driving through the rear view mirror. You know, you're not going to actually get ahead of that change curve and learn faster than the competition. So principles, I'm going to buzz right through and talk about um, what, why, because you're going to discover those as we do that activity in that Lance was suggesting. Agile reduces the cost and impact of change. At the heart of it, Agile reduces change. It allows us to learn faster than we would learn without embracing Agile because it uses uh, iterations or small segments of time, learning cycles, let's call it, of two weeks to actually see how it's going, you know, take a bold chance, try something, do it, learn from it, and then apply that learning through continuous experimentation. So Agile uses that process to accelerate learning. But learning is at the heart of Agile. Does that make sense? Very important that you guys understand that. Learning is at the heart of being able to deal with extreme change, right? Because you've got to try something, even if it's chaotic change, you know, and learn from it. Reduces the cycle time by putting in those iterative, uh, iter iteration is the cycle that uh, Agile learning takes place in. And generally it's one or two weeks. So it's a very compressed learning cycle, you know, where you generate thin slices of product, thin slices of output to see how the customers react, you know, and experience it. Then you'll flush out what their real requirements are. Because it's another delusion to assume that customers really know exactly what right. they want before they're actually seeing it. There's a whole right? problem with the analysis. And totally. Anyway. And analysis paralysis right. just makes it worse. Because a lot of times you think, if I just spend more time, we'll get it nailed down at the front, right? You've got to give them something. Even if it's, if, it, if it's a total failure, you learn more in the doing and the giving than if you overanalyze it at the beginning, which you'll never hit the mark anyway. Because sometimes they'll just say, yeah, yeah. You know, they know they put that much work into it. It's not really what they want, and you'll, you'll not achieve that delight in the customer. Uh, accelerated learning and all at a more sustainable pace. Sustainability is also important in Agile in terms of being able to maintain this really competitive edge. You've got to give your team and yourselves a break, and really what we do in the software engineering world that I uh, interact with is make sure that we don't work any more than 40 hours a week. It actually becomes a really important rule. You cannot burn your people out. You cannot burn yourself out. You absolutely have to preserve that energy, you know, for creating value and then uh, make that sustainable because otherwise um, you're not going to have that sustainable competitive edge. So bottom line, what we do in Agile is we flip the paradigm completely from the waterfall or the Addy model you know, to focus entirely on, instead of cost, schedule, and budget, you know, the requirement scope, uh, we focus on features, and we focus on delighting the customer, you know, and we do the features that are capable of being done within the constraints, the time frame, so we, we strategically manage those constraints, but we flip the triple constraint on its head. This is the first kind of paradigm shift that we go through in an agile environment. Go, go, go back. Go back, just uh -huh. let everybody get this for a second. 30 questions, I think, because that's an important, concept. that's a great slide. Yeah, thank you, and it's an important slide. concept. Does this make sense to everyone? You know, a lot of times we spend all our time focusing on locking down the requirements, right? We locked them and loaded them, you know, they're not going to change. Then we figure out what's the cost and what's the schedule, and we develop a plan, and we replan, and we replan, and we replan until we can lock this all down. It's called the triple constraint. And oftentimes the customer or the client 
you know, tries to lock down all elements of that triple constraint, which turns it into an iron triangle of impossibility. We're all familiar with that, you know, the, the challenge of that, right? So we flip that whole thing on its head. You know, in Agile, what we flip on its head is we focus on features. What do you want? We'll tell you how long it'll take. We'll tell you the, the minimum viable product that we can create in the least amount of time for you because we've been compressing our value stream and pushing out the waste. We get better and better at this all the time, right? So just tell us what you want and we'll tell you what the cost and the schedule is. And if any of these constraints are bound, in other words, a lot of times we'll be dealing with customers who are locked into a schedule constraint, right? What, what I like here is when you say, tell, a lot of people are going to say, well, people don't know what they want. Yeah. And I love the phrase, the vision creates feature estimates. Exactly. Like asking them, what's your vision? Totally. That, you don't have to be specific, but totally. give us a, a, give us a, maybe you could talk a bit more about that. Yeah, it's, it's by the great vision. that you picked that up, Lance, because remember, the customer rarely knows exactly what they want, especially if they're bound by their own paradigms of the way it's always been, right? Just give me what I always have, only better. And you should know what I want, so just show me. And then, but, but it's got to be within this fixed budget, right? Whereas if you start by looking at what does the customer want to do with what you're giving? What are the learning objectives? What does success look like? You start by defining the vision of success, the future vision of success, and then you co-create it together. That's the other thing about Agile and Lean. You work in lockstep with your customers, or at least a customer focus group or a customer proxy that represents your customer's knowledge, right? You don't just like say, got it, got it, got it, walk away, do this hard development, you know, and show it at the end, right? You do it continuously. Do you work with yep. a subject matter expert? Or, because I, I mean, the, a lot of the instructional design is about subject matter, subject matter experts. How does Agile deal with that? Yeah, excellent question, Lance. You're dealing with, you need to find a subject matter expert in the domain space that you're developing work in, especially if you do not have that domain expertise. Ideally, your customer does. But if your customer doesn't, you're going to need to make sure that you bring in just the right expertise at just the right time. Now, Lance's questions are great because he's flushing out the fact that we don't do big upfront design in Agile. We don't do big bang, upfront design, bring in all the experts, lock it all down, load it all down, and then develop it, right? It's, we use what's called a thin slice. And this is the second paradigm that you'll have to kind of wrap your head around a little differently. You know, this is the hardest thing for designers to really understand as they move into an agile world. And that would be product designers or any kind of designers. You know, their comfort zone is in really, they're actually, they've learned to be, typically, uh, designers have learned to be very comfortable, oops, sorry, sorry, uh, in getting um, all the requirements locked down. You know, and they're very, their comfort zone is in getting that locked down so they can envision that bicycle, for example, that Lance was showing at the beginning. End to end, and they can mock it up, and they can do a three-dimensional model, you know, and they, they really want that level of security, but, the problem is things change so fast and the customer doesn't really know what they want. You know, when I was at Disney, for example, all of our Imagineers, you know, did lock down every single attraction, you know, with three-dimensional models and everything else before they had the control to do that because they were the customer. But in the real world that most of us live in today, you know, things change so fast. Well, what the customers think they really need is not what they really need. So we have to actually get comfortable in zeroing in on the vision and sketches. Does that make sense? The vision, the outcome, the sketches, you know, and approximate with the subject matter expert and the customer hand in hand. Co-create the design, right? Co-create it. You know, not expecting uh, it to, you know, just not expecting it to, it evolves. The design emerges out of the doing of it. The design emerges out of the use. So you've got to, what we call a thin slice, you've got to design a thin slice, you know, that you get out there in the hands of the customers and really have them work it, and then you tune it and you iterate. You make it better and better and better, yes. So then it sounds like our role shifts from being design experts who come in to consult to being innovation partners yes. who help prototype and not to be afraid to Exactly. And catalysts, design catalysts.
catalysts, if you will, to really think of that bold, new, disruptive idea, right, as opposed to the safe, traditional lockdown, the requirements. So you're absolutely right. You know, thinking of it in terms of your role and your competencies, and you're also, you become more facilitators as well. Because understanding the fact that collaboration is key, you know, Lance used a great uh, expression in terms of his role as um, the, uh, the, the sand in the oyster to create the pearl. In a sense, you've got to actually take on that role as well. You've got to be the catalyst for, or you've got to be, the, if we use the metaphor of you're heading into a new territory, you've got to be the scouts you know, you've got to be the catalyst for change, and you've got to be the facilitators and motivators to inspire that innovation, blazing a new trail. You know, kind of a lot of metaphors kind of thrown in there at the same time. But does that make sense? How things are going to have to change? Yes. It, it does. And, and that's really what I, you know, you've mentioned before, the customer doesn't really know what they yes. want. Right. It's a lot of times it's because we're the experts. They don't know what's possible. Exactly. You know, you sit down with the client and they say, well, I don't really know what's possible. Can you educate me? So one of the best ways to do that is, you know, when you talk about the thin slice. Yes. You know, I created these, you know, partially functional, I call them partially yeah, yeah. functional prototypes. Exactly. So exactly. at a meeting with the client, yep. there's there's a partially functional prototype that's exactly. there with us so that at least, you know, when we're talking in words, we're yes. also seeing something actually. Right. And that's that's an excellent example. And that is being agile. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can also make it a three-dimensional box or, you know, mm -hmm. kind of design, you know, something else that's metaphorically capturing what the vision of the client is, mm -hmm. you know, to pull that out of them. To really create that, you want to create a wow effect for your customers, what it boils down to. Agile, with a focus on customer value, wants to create that disruptive customer value. Not just like what you think they want in a conservative approach, but that like, wow, you know, and being adaptive. It's got to emerge, it's got to be adaptive. So your role does change. And one of the tools that you have that you're already using is that rapidly emerging prototype, you know, that you demo, you get them to interact with. You know, you get, you're trying to get full engagement from your customers, you know, so that you guys co-create the design. So you're right, your role does change from the designer, you know, solo, you know, the expert designer, to being the catalyst for disruptive, innovative design that's co-created with your subject matter experts and your customers, right? Great, you guys are rapidly heading into this new frontier. Um, awesome. Other questions or other observations or comments? Yes. I'm with you on this, but suppose you have a customer who is, they want to know what it's going to cost yeah. and how long it's going to take. Excellent. How, how do you deal with that? That is a great question and it's the $60 million question. Right. <laughs> you know, um, so the way I deal with that is trying to understand kind of what Lance was talking about with the vision. What's the value to them? Right? So you don't actually lock yourself into the um, pet trap, you know, of saying, I can do it for $9.99, you know, that kind of thing. You want to actually change the dialogue to value and what's, how is this product going to create value for them? So when they bring up the conversation of cost, you kind of, as you're in your role of a, a communication catalyst, you try and explore what is the value and the importance. And you try, by doing that, do you see how you get powerfully more information than if you didn't have that conversation? You're understanding what the boundaries are that you can work in, in terms of what they feel the real value is, and you're flushing out the vision that they have in terms of how they might use this product to create value for themselves or their customers. Does that make sense? You, you have the conversation, you try to change the conversation to value. At the end of the day, they're going to give you a ceiling. They're going to give you a cap. The maximum budget is X. Then you're going to use that as a constraint. You're going to use that cost as a constraint to influence the features and the schedule. See how these three work in uniform, in unison? You know, you will, you, you don't want to jump right into the budget discussion. You want to talk into the value discussion first until you get together to, the, to, the, to this uh, actual budget. But then you use the budget to actually influence the features that you can deliver within that constraint. You see how you've actually managed that iron triangle, that triple constraint, by elevating the conversation to value and 
customer value, which Agile is all about. Great questions. Does that make sense? Cool. Excellent. Yes. So what if you work for a nonprofit and they have no budget? Excellent. That's <laughs> these questions are awesome. You know what I do with nonprofits and with um, and with, with uh, um, profitable uh, focused companies is the first thing I do when I'm actually starting to work with a client is I try to understand their value model. And so when, I'll give you a very specific example, one that I was doing for UC Berkeley. Um, the profit model, I mean, sorry, the value model for UC Berkeley is completely different than, let's say, the value model for Walmart, both my clients. Um, you can imagine, they're like totally, you know, different ends of the spectrum. UC Berkeley's value model is prestige in the industry in terms of creating knowledge. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's a nonprofit, or you know, that's a, a organization, an academic organization, whose primary value focus is creating knowledge that's useful to, um, you know, to develop their, to attract new students and to develop their their vision, you know, of of creating new knowledge. Does that make sense? So whatever the goodwill might be uh, a nonprofit's uh, value model, ending world hunger, you know, whatever the model is, you, as part of your vision and value conversation, you make sure you understand that. It's incredibly important. If you want to deliver and focus on customer value, that you know what the value model of your customer is. You need to start, so these are great questions. You need to start by understanding what your customer's perspective on value is. And don't let your value perspective influence your customers. You've got to go in with a total empathy map on your customer, right? And I understand I, their I, view I of value. Can back on this? Yes. A nonprofit still has money. Yes. All, all, it, it does, or it'd be out of business. It, it has it's to just, have sustainable So the value conversation is that yeah. money's being spent on something. Right. Right. No nonprofit can operate without money. So just like Berkeley can't operate without money. Right. So the yeah, issue is grants. how do you get how do you the get the money the how, how do you is what you're going to do valuable enough to the organization? If it's the not, cost. then it shouldn't exactly. be done. Exactly. If you can't you know, the, the nonprofit's yeah. a great one. Yeah. If it's just not valuable <laughs> enough, don't do it. Yeah. And that's the that's the essence of Sorry to interrupt you. Saying, no, no, it's great. That, like, that it's great. Up. And that's the essence of, of starting with a value model. Because the one thing we often forget is how do the customers truly measure value? You know, that's the heart of Agile. Really being able to measure value and being able to amplify it in such a way that everybody knows what that value measure is so that everybody on the project team, you know, has a clear line of sight to what that customer perceives as value. So yes. I'm going to push you one more. Yeah, 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 go so for it. I'm sitting here thinking, I get it, but yeah, yeah. does Agile have techniques of how you have that conversation? Because I think everybody gets I've been to design, and I don't think any of this is surprising anybody. Go, yeah, yeah, I want to have a conversation about value. Does Agile have any tools, techniques, processes that help have that conversation? Um, there are no cookie cutter tools okay. that help have that conversation. There are technique tools um, that Agile uses. There's a lot of practices and, and models in Agile that I intended to sort of steer away from tonight um, because. When we're really learning, we're really trying to learn how to be agile. It's not so much about the tools. But I will share with you guys, if you're very interested in this specific topic, an example of a local um, company that's perfected the design of a value model, Intel. Intel's done some pioneering work on this. This would serve you better than a cookie cutter agile tool. Intel's done some amazing work. They put some of their best engineers on a five-year project, partnering with their HR people, partnering with their finance people, to develop a quantifiable and repeatable value model for how Intel measures value. And when I'll send you guys the white paper and the worksheets that emerged out of that study, and when you see how, Ad, how Intel used Agile and value modeling to totally blow away the competition and create a competitive edge for themselves that was like shattered. You know, you'll see how they've done this. And you can use that as an example. So I can I can share with you examples of what other companies have done. But um, generally what I do is I, I kind of veer away from models. I, I'm going to give you a little bit a deeper uh, explanation of that. Um, bottom line, because of the rapid change, 
you don't want to get too hung up on a specific tool or a specific model because each transformation or each organization that you work with is going to have need a unique way of dealing with the change that's dynamic there. Very specifically, if I'm working with Berkeley and when I go and work with Walmart or Visa where I just came from today, I don't try and use the same model I use at Walmart for Visa or Berkeley, right? I try and kind of elevate it up to kind of pull in the best of models and we'll pull in the Intel model but we'll always customize that model. You know, Ericsson down the road has another great example of how they've applied Agile to innovation and create uh, disruptive innovation. But um, I, I kind of discourage cookie cutter approaches to that because uh, it's far more, I found it to be far more valuable to focus on what the customer needs and have that conversation very focused on each individual customer pulling in, having a toolkit, building your toolkit to be robust enough to use Six Sigma, to use Lean, to use Scrum, to use XP, those are all models and tools. You know, use what's out there, you know, to serve you in service to your customer. I hope that helps. But I can share with you um, all of the popular tools that are out there as well. Cool, great question, you guys. We're sort of deviating from our plan, but I think it's, it's uh, if, if it's cool with you, we'll keep this pace up is good with the questions and do toss out those questions as they emerge then. Um, as Lance had mentioned at the end of these, uh, these slides, I've got very specific thought-provoking ways that you might apply this to instructional design. So it's great that you're, um, you're actually doing this deep level of thinking and questioning as we go over those. So how do Agile teams work? What's different about the way Agile teams work? You know, they uh, maximize communication. If you understand that this real disruptive innovation comes from collaborative work, you make sure that you maximize communication to every person on the team. And they do that typically by using different extended channels of communication, not only making sure you have two-way communication, but Agile uses, some of the tools Agile does use are what's called big visible walls. Everything gets up and on the wall so that everything is transparently shared with everybody and you focus on really the highest value uh, work. But in an Agile environment, you're gonna see walls plastered, every conceivable space. The floors are used, walls are used, story cards are used. Anybody can walk in and get a sense of what's going on in the project or the team or wherever the project is. Oftentimes, we'll also use kind of empathy maps on the wall to make, kind of get a, a reading of how people are doing. One of the things that Lance uh, often talks about is the importance of measuring return on attention, ROA. You know, we, we uh, in Agile, we pay attention to not only how people are spending their time, but also return on training investment time. You know, ROTI, R-O-T-I. You know, that's a, that's a chart that we use consistently. You know, trying to amplify feedback however you can in the environment and the culture that you're working in. You know, you want to get that open channel of communication and communicate, communicate, communicate. In times of change, you need to communicate even more extremely than you normally would as seasoned professionals. Um, Self-organizing, very important to give up. Um, management's role changes significantly. They need to remove blockers, but let the team self-organize. So once you've stood up your team, once you've got your learning objectives out there, once you know what the outcome is gonna look like, if you're leading the team, you need to actually enable the team to self-organize, right? That truly empowers the team and it activates their full potential. You know, um, that's a lot different than traditional management where you come in with a task board every day and you say, I want you to do this and I want you to do this and it should look exactly like this and I want it to be done by noon. You know, that, does, that conversation doesn't happen in an agile world. You know, you flip that whole conversation, it's part of the paradigm change as well. Um, agile teams, you, it's important that you assemble, Lance had questions earlier about SMEs, it's, it's subject matter experts, it's important that you assemble all the talent and all the skills you need before you launch a design session, right? You need to get everybody in the room so they can hear <coughs> all the requirements at the same time, kind of like IDEO Labs does. You're familiar with the IDEO design lab? You know, they make sure they got everybody in the room, they focus and then they get out of the building and actually watch their customers in action to kind of build on that. Yes? Okay, so you talked about everybody in the room. Everybody in the room. 
Is it a physical room, a virtual room, or both? You, you, you named it, right, because very rarely do we have the luxury of having, for most multinational global companies, we generally don't have everybody in the same physical room. So let's use that figuratively. And I'll give you a very specific example. When I was at GAP, leading the Agile Transformation there, all of our teams had members that were in Brazil or in China or in India. So in the room, like say for example, if this was the room, you know, we would have um, big uh, vi video screens and we would have full-time uh, Skype access to the team members who were remote. When we were having a team meeting and we had all the team members sitting around a table, we get very comfortable with having a big video screen at the end of this table here and a big video screen at the end of the table with the team members in Brazil. And we just go around the room and then we hand over to the Brazil team and they go around the room and, and, it, and it, it equalizes and normalizes the challenge of distance, right? But the spirit of your question is a really good one. The spirit is open channels of communication and making sure that you address the constraints that are caused by distance. And believe it or not, if you've got some team members in, you know, five miles away, they might as well be in Brazil, you know, in terms of the importance of that, that uh, communication. It's kind of, we, we call it information radiators. The farther distant a team member is, you know, even if they're on a different floor, you still have to address their needs and be very respectful of communication with them as a remote team member, yes. So you talk about being all the participants in the room. Yes. Um, what about the user? Yes. The this is going to end up being for at the end. Do yes. They, do they bring those people in as well? Exactly. Like, Good okay. question, right. And you rarely will have, a, let's say your customer is a uh, preschool uh, user, let's just say. You know, you're probably not going to have the preschooler in the room, but you need to have a SME who's a proxy, a proxy representative of the preschooler in the room, and then you need to test, like IDEA would, the IDEA labs, you know, go to a preschool environment, watch the preschoolers interact with a prototype of your, you know, so you might have to go to where the user is, but you always have a customer proxy in the room, you know, representing the voice of the user, and that person is the representative of the user. Um, ideally, they're on the project 100% of the time, or 100% accessible to you, even if they're not in the room, right? Because reality has some constraints, but you know, I mean, that's the spirit, the spirit. You guys are, are really asking good questions in terms of the spirit of Lean and Agile, in terms of how you would deal with the natural constraints that you run into in the real world. Um, um, they have very, um, daily stand-ups are one of the tools, Lance was asking about tools that we typically use. You know, having daily stand-ups is a powerful agile tool because it gets everybody together for just five, ten minutes a day, gets you all aligned on what the priorities are for the day. You all make commitments to each other in terms of what you're going to get done that day, and that is a powerful tool to actually enable you to focus and deliver on what you committed to your team members. You know, so oftentimes a very standard tool or practice that's used in most of the actual practices is a daily stand-up. You know, whether it's a management team, whether it's an executive leadership team, imagine the power of just connecting and everybody checking in and everybody knowing that everybody else is there to help them, committing to what you're gonna get done you know, you're not gonna let your team members down, so you're gonna do everything in your power to um, remove any kind of constraints, any interruptions, you know, that uh, will enable you to get your focus. Uh, when you look at really high-performing Agile teams, and there are a lot of them in the Bay Area, I often take tours to high-performing Agile teams. If you're interested, we can arrange a tour of Pivotal Labs, for example. Those are the big guns in the Bay Area. They're the best of the best. If you were to come with me on a tour to Pivotal Labs, and you can see the tour of Pivotal Labs online, I'll send the link as, as well as the Intel material, you will see that these guys are um, like a machine in terms of effective design and effective. They nail every single project, and you know how hard that is. You know, they've got a reputation that is absolutely unbelievable. And what they do is not only do they have company-wide daily stand-ups for five minutes in the morning, to really pull people together and to kind of 
get them charged up high energy for the day, but they have no email engines or clients on their desktop, right? You can't get email if you're at Pivotal, right? No interruptions from email. You have one kiosk, you know, by the bathrooms, that if you absolutely have to go check the, with the outer world to get um, your emails, you can do that during a break, but you're not disrespecting the team member who's focused together. They pair um, very aggressively. At Pivotal, there's always two people working on every single thing at the same time, right? You've got the best of two minds working on something. It gives you, that has been proven, pairing has been proven to give you exponential returns on the productivity because the energy level that goes into two people solving a design problem at the same time is far greater than the effort of two people, right? The, the outcome, the product, is far more beneficial. It's probably the most productive uh, way of working. A uh, pairing and pivotal pairs, they rotate pairs every day. So let's say we as a group here are on one team. We will rotate every day. We'll self-organize with our rotation. What do you think that rotation achieves? Full redundancy, optimal productivity, great respect and teamwork, you know, great bonding, and most importantly, knowledge transfer. Because everybody in this room tonight, I am totally confident, has a domain expertise that you know, exemplifies you from the rest of the group. Imagine everybody pairing with everybody else. It is the fastest way to acquire knowledge and skills. You know, you're learning real time, working with the expert side by side, rotating every day. It's an amazing, um, so pivotal, no email, on their desktops, you know, they focus, they're really well fed, they get a really good gourmet hot breakfast every day, gourmet lunch, you know, but they respectfully breaks, they have play areas, you know, they have uh, table tennis and, you know, so they have fun, you know, and they follow the rules of Agile to a T. Everybody goes home at six o'clock. Everybody starts at nine in the morning. A hot breakfast is available for them from 8.30 to 9. They have their daily stand-up every day at 9. You know, they work. They really crunch. They crank it. You know, they work, you know, intensely. Um, they're so passionate about their work, they wouldn't even think of getting distracted by a phone call or an email. You know, they are that focused on their work, their team, their customer, their product. The customer is with them. The customer, your question about the customer, they're with them. The designer is with them. They work with the development team, the designer, and the customer. Those are the only people on the team, and they work together. I think that's going to be a tough one to bring into instructional design. I think that's what we're exactly like Possibly. that. But again, what's the, it's distilling the essence of what that accomplishes, yes. not how they're doing it. Because I exactly. don't think we all live in a world where we have no email. So the way that that company does it, I don't think is transferable. Yes, but, but the essence of what they're trying to do is what I'm trying to get at. Yes, so think about that. Lance's challenge on that. You know, you might not work in an environment where you can buffer yourself completely right. from email, but think of ways that you might be able to buffer your distractions, because the spirit here is context switching is a killer. It is a silent killer that kills your productivity. You cannot imagine the impact of every time you're really in that zone, that flow zone of developing your own content, you get the bing, you know, look at who sent me this stupid email, right? So, so, you know, you're right. They might not be in a situation where they can take it off of their desk, but you can control the flow. And generally what we use in Agile, we recommend for you to use in Agile, would be what's called a Pomodoro technique. And that is, you use your kitchen Pomodoro, your little tomato, Thank you, Lance. Bye. You can use your little kitchen timer, you know, to set a, to commit to yourself that you're going to stay totally focused on your next design task for the next 20 minutes, and nothing's going to interrupt you. You will not go to your email. You will not take a call. You will shut the door. Whatever. That's how you can actually apply the, this technique to buffer yourself. You'd be amazed at what you can get done in 20 minutes. You know, and you'd be amazed that then after the 20 minutes, you need a break. So then go check your email all you want. You know, give yourself a 10 minute break and then do it again. 20 minutes a day, even if you work solo, would be a way that you can apply these techniques. I appreciate um, Lance kind of pulling it back into the, your instructional design work. Another thing 
Learning continuously through retrospectives. We talked about Agile being a learning system. It's really a learning system and a learning mindset. We set aside time at frequent intervals, ideally at least once a week, where you really sit down and if you are working with others on your instructional design content, you have a heart-to-heart -heart retrospective. You generally ask, what's going well? What could we do better? And then you make a commitment to doing something better each week. That's how you ensure the learning takes place. And if you don't, if you have a retrospective without real learning, then you haven't really achieved the goal of learning, right? So learning is actionable. Learning requires some action to take place as a result of that. Cool. So agile values, these are pretty consistent probably with the values that you use. Yes. I'm sorry, can you go back to the previous sure. slide? I have a question. Oh, sure, absolutely. On the third bullet point where it says, is dedicated to a single project. Yes. So that would, in an instructional design world, I would think, that would mean that if you're working on a particular learning objective, or if you're working on a particular outcome to a product, mm -hmm. think of it, to a product for the customer, is that you try to stay focused on that product, very much like the email example I just gave, right? What happens is, and I'll give you the empirical data to kind of support this. If you're being pulled on two different content development tasks at the same time that are different, your productivity on both of those goes down by at least 20%. Context switching, you know, totally like, agree. And if you're working on three, you know, we're push-pull, I need these both by tomorrow, you know, um, your productivity goes down on all three of them by 40%, right? And it gets worse and worse. It's exponential. So the same example we just gave for email, you know, the email interruptions, it's incumbent on you as leaders to carve out the time to zero in on one, to get it as much done as possible, and then take a break. And if they both have the same demanding timelines, that's reality. But by you controlling your environment and your focus, and allowing yourself to get into flow, by giving yourself the 20 minutes to work on this, and then you set it aside and honestly commit to giving up that focus and giving yourself the next 20 minutes to work on the next one, then you'll achieve this. Even if you don't have the luxury of working on a single product end to end. Right, you have to you have to buffer. You have to build in your own buffers. Yes. You do morning afternoon. Yeah, you morning afternoon is perfect. One context in the morning, one context in the totally, afternoon. Totally right, and the, and the value of that is really you commit to yourself. You're not going to waffle. You know, oh, I forgot this, or let me follow up with that, or to, you know what I mean. Once you make the commitment, mornings are for product A, afternoons are for product B. That works beautifully. Right. Yes. Now let's throw the fire in there. All oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Because There's that, always that's, that's the world my team lives in. Yes. We're focused on products. Yes. We got hit two weeks ago with a big fire. Yeah. And it was a matter of throwing everything up in the air and reallocating priorities. Totally. So we have a deliverable. We have to. We have a fire. We have to fix this. Totally. We have limited resources, and of course, if you're fixing the fire, it's limited time. Totally. Everyone lives in that world. Yeah. I guarantee you that. I just came from Visa when I came here. That's all they talked about, capacity and how they fight the fires and the, the reality, you know. So it is, it is a reality, right? It's, it's the reality. So the most important thing for you to do in cases like that is find a way to really prioritize what's of highest value. Going back to the value map we talked about earlier, right? Sometimes fires, sometimes people get um, habituated on creating fires so that they can, you know, get pull your attention. Sometimes fires aren't really fires. You know, I mean, production being down or, uh, you know, you, you'll know, you'll be able to measure that, you know. But ultimately the reality is then deal, divide and conquer, but learn from it. So at the end of that, or look for patterns is what my um, advice to you would be. How often does that happen? If 80% of your time, it, your team's capacity, sorry, is consumed by fighting fires, then you need to actually start to plan for the fires. And actually don't plan on new development content work to be done. You know, carve out the buffer. It's called buffer in uh, Lean. You know, it's like elevate the constraint. Find out the source, the root cause of those. Is it a quality issue? Is it a 
training the uh, end customer expectation setting issue? Is it a manager issue? You know, you're kind of trying to find the root cause of those fires and uh, actually try to address them at the source. And the most effective way I've found that we deal with that is through um, data, you know, trends of data. Let's look at how disruptive our normal plan planning patterns are by firefighting and then try to buffer the capacity of your team to handle the fires, to manage the flow. Remember when I was talking about lean at the beginning, it was the flow of value? Those fires are, are disruptors of that flow, right? The fires are waste. You know, I mean, sadly they are. They are a reality, but they're not, it's like wishful thinking isn't gonna actually help future fires go away. You know, especially if there's a pattern of firefighting you know, you have to sort of elevate the pattern and really re-estimate uh, re your capacity and make sure that you buffer it in to like 70% because you need to reserve 30%. I used to call it in the box. You know, I always had 30% of my people in the box, you know, to handle the fires, not, not making commitments to customers. And if, if, they, if a, a miracle occurred and they, you didn't need them to be in the box, guess what? You've got space for innovation because they have been tasked out for that 30%. Question? Some cultures, or well, observation, some cultures reward firefighters. Yes. And yes. they do not, they ignore the people who say, look, you're going to have fire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Until it's blazing. Yes, And then exactly. the person who puts the fire out gets all the... Exactly. Mm -hmm. you're, oh, you're so right. In fact, most cultures reward firefighting. And that's a question of educating the leaders. And the best way to do that um, we skirted on the topic of metrics throughout the, the talk tonight. We kind of skirted on the topic of metrics, but let's say you are actually tracking the delivery of value. We talked about the value model. The outcomes of a value model is a value index that you actually score. You know, you score and track the cost of value or your team's ability to create value. So you, in Agile, once your team, create a buffer for your team let them work uninterrupted together on a comparable product, you know, and track what that team's, it's called velocity, which basically is a measure of the team's capacity. So you baseline that team's capacity. After three iterations, if you're all working as a team, let's pick the first row here. You guys are a team. You start to work to each other. You know your strengths. You've got your own working agreements. Let's say we have two-week iterations where you're just cranking out products, you know, instructional design products. You know, you know pretty soon what your team's capacity is. And if you're tracking it in terms of value points that you're able to deliver, you'll know pretty consistently that between the four of you, you can generate about 30 value points per week. You know, you'll figure that out. The cadence if you start tracking it, right? You know, then after three or four weeks, you stabilize on that. You know what it is. Then when the fire hits, you can, you can elevate to management the impact of firefighting has on that team. Because guess what? Their productivity from 30 value points a week is going to go down to maybe zero, right? If a critical member of that team. So that is a bold tool for you to use to help leaders understand, see, see what happens to our planned, you know, delivery dates and commitments. And all you have to do is start tracking that team's capacity to deliver value by measuring value points that are pretty consistent. Don't over-engineer it, right? Every single row in this group could have the same team velocity. You'll be able to capture that. You'll be able to elevate that conversation and expose the impact of bad management in terms of not. In our case, to close the loop, we evaluated what were the highest value yes. things, who had the most subject matter knowledge, awesome. how to reallocate his work, keep him focused, what could we parse out to someone else, how could we, with someone who had less expertise, deal with the fire. So it was taking into account subject matter expertise, yes. speed, value, what could we triage till later. Exactly, very well done. You know, um, in terms of just reality, right? Another thing that you can use to your advantage is if you are able to work on a pairing structure, the pairs give you a little buffer from triage as well, right? Because in a pitch, worst case scenario, you're losing the advantage of the pair, but you can actually buffer the team from the impacts of a fire by having pairs be your buffer. Does that make sense? But 
Thanks for bringing up those reality check questions because they always happen. They happen in every industry, in every company. I, I want to understand. So we have a client, and this client is always in that scope period. Yes. So this process is exactly what it is. You know, the idea of you come in and sit down and say, this is the way I'm not going to change my philosophy is let's change what um, Yes. So this, this model works. I'm trying to understand is as you go through these cycles to create yes. a, a better product, Yes. Where, because the client's an external client, yes. where do you get constraints on that where you don't let the client keep? Excellent going? question. Go, but he's going to keep going. Where can I continue? Yeah, excellent question. You remember we were talking about this team here having the capacity to, to deliver 30 value points a week. So you have your customer. This is how you, net, you handle that with the customer. You have the customer queue up the next 30 points of value that are highest importance to him. Because you remind him, this team can only handle 30 value points. If you try to throw 35 at them, what's going to happen? They're going to implode, right? They can't handle that capacity. Remember the Lucy and, you know, the oh, I Love Lucy where they were on the, you know, the candy thing? That's going to happen to that team, right? So you actually have a control, you know, by help, by engaging with the customer, they have full choice to identify what are their next 30 value points that are of highest priority. Scope creep solved. They choose. They choose what this team's going to do next. And you don't have any scope creep because they're self-organizing around it, right? They can only tell you the top 30 points. They can't give you 35. They can't switch in. That Those are two rules. They, they can only source to this team based on this team's <coughs> capacity. And they can't change midstream. You know, firefights excluded. They can't change midstream. My client also likes to say it's going to be three months and then it's eight months later. So <coughs> they're like, same thing, like, will they just keep and give me 30? I mean, I'm yeah, sure because I'm just trying to actually think through this from an execution level. If this team's consistently ready to crank 30 a week, that team, that customer is going to get trained really quickly on queuing up 30 per week. And he's not going to waste his time queuing up what's going to be done eight months down the line, right? Because he knows, he, he actually is going to like this, this scenario. Because he knows he's got instant gratification. They're going to be able to give him back what he wanted in 30 a week. Or maybe they need, it's a big training component. They need two weeks, so it's going to be 60, right? That makes sense? So you train your, your customer really easily and the bad behaviors actually stop because you're using real data and trends to deliver this value to them very rapidly. Does that make sense? They're seeing results. What happens in the typical real world, what typically happens in the real world, is all these changes keep taking place and everybody's firefighting and they don't see anything. So they just keep giving you more and more. Just makes the matter worse and these four teams you know, are not generating any value because they're firefighting constantly and they're being tugged and pulled. Now I want this, now I want that, now I want that. So you stop all that bad behavior at the source you know, by elevating and using these big visible charts to let everybody know what they're working on. And the rule is you can't change in the middle of the week. You have to wait and let them finish. You know, the, the rule of that is start finishing and stop starting. You know, kind of the, so let them finish. Um, that's kind of like the, the golden rule. They, they, the customer can't change their mind at midweek. Once they, once they commit to what they want that one week, they've got to let these guys deliver. And the manager's role is to buffer the firefighting and try and find reinforcements. And if they have pairs, it's going to help them. Yeah, so I kind of have a situation with a client sort of like this where, I, where I've done part and I want to check with them and say, so is this what you're envisioning yes. right now? And they're always saying, well, I'm too busy to do that right now. Yes. So that, that weekly back and forth check, how do you make that happen? It's a, it's a really good question, and it depends on how bold you want to be with it. You know, if, we were, if Lance were still here, I would hazard a guess that Lance would say, okay, if you're too busy to give me feedback, I'm too busy to do your work. You know? And that's generally what really good agile leaders do, right? They make up the rule before you even get started. You know, we have a working agreement. So we use working agreements as a, as a popular tool in Agile, where we say, okay, you're going to be available for us. Even if it's only 70% of your time, whatever, you make that working agreement, you make a commitment, and if they're too busy to give you feedback, then you're too busy with other clients to, you know, and you have to actually 
you know, sometimes sort of a, a tough approach like that is exactly what they need because it's in their best interest. Because if they don't give you the feedback you need, you're not going to give them the product they need. And then it's going to be lose-lose as opposed to win-win, right? So you, but you can't, here's the danger, especially if they've become acculturated to that, that they've been able to slide, it's really hard to change midstream. For any new clients, you make the working agreement that this is the deal, we shake on it. And then um, you can enforce it. You know, because when you do a working agreement, you give each other permission. In fact, you make it mandatory that you call each other on the violations of the working agreement. The last element of your working agreement is always, if I demonstrate any behavior that is inconsistent to this commitment I just made, it's incumbent on you to call me on it. Because if you don't, then we're both at fault, right? So we need each other to call each other, yes. So our working agreement today is in 10 minutes we have to end. Cool. So <laughs> if you would cover the things that you think we need to hear in the next 10 minutes, Excellent. it would be great. I can easily do that, thank you. Um, and everybody cool with that? We're going to kind of go through this really quickly. Agile values, um, they're pretty classic, the values. I don't think anything up here is going to surprise anybody. The behaviors, these are some of the things we're going to start and some of the things we're going to have to stop. Uh, any controlling behaviors, self-serving behaviors, these would all be called out in your working agreements, but these are classic examples of what you have to give up, you know, to... Um, Simple rules are also something that you come up with in your working agreements. We look out for each other, we cover for each other. It's all about the team, it's all about collaboration, it's all about the spirit of doing what's best for your client. So you generally would have a series of simple rules, values, working into your working agreements. Um, the basics of lean, almost everything we've been talking about now is kind of pulled in a little bit of lean, but I talked to you a little bit about it this at the beginning so I can go through this very quickly. Lean creates more value with less waste. The important thing to walk away from this t t tonight is we're talking about doing less with lean, not more with less. Any of you have been operating under that insane adage of do more with less, you know, give it up. That's another paradigm we're inviting you to change. You've got to actually expose the things that you're going to not do anymore and actually do less. Doing more with less is long past due to retire. You've got to actually do less. And that means stop doing marginal value work and stop doing work that's wasteful. And we're going to go over what, what some of those might be. Um, are you, lean organizations understand and measure customer value. We talked a lot about that tonight. Um, the five key principles of lean are value, measuring value, quantifying value, managing value. I'm going to send you guys the intel report. Value stream, that's the end-to-end -end value cycle. Flow, the uninterrupted flow of value across the stream. Pull, that is the customer pulls when they're ready. And the customer pulls the value. And perfection is a rule and a principle in lean, but you'll notice I added three question marks here. In the true spirit of agile, we end in the true spirit of lean now as it's evolving. Sometimes there's waste associated with perfection over-engineering, polishing the apple, you know, putting too much. So we generally, even though perfection is the word that will appear if you do any research on this, I generally substitute excellence for that. Good enough for now is an important adage, um, and Lance talked about that at the beginning of the session. Perfection is sometimes a luxury that we can't afford. So you have to know kind of good enough for now to get through. The eight wastes of lean, and you can apply this to um, to instructional design are typically uh, moving things from one person to another, excess inventory, um, motion, you know, just moving again, uh, waiting for things, waiting for approvals, waiting for the expert, waiting for anything, customer feedback if they're not available, overproduction, making more than is immediately necessary. You want to optimize that flow. You don't want to have any excess inventory as well, right? <laughs> Think of it from a manufacturing. That would mean excess work in your backlog actually distracts you. Um, Overprocessing, defects, and skills. This is a big one that's often overlooked. Making sure you've got the right people with the right skills and that you take the time to, to train your talent and do skill building for yourself, most importantly, and for your team as well. So how we can apply Agile and Lean to instructional design? Um, the challenges ahead of us are always going to be outside of our current comfort zone and repertoire. 
That's the first mental model we have to sort of acknowledge. It's never going to go back to normal. Normal. It's never going to go back to the good old days. You know, the, the quote that lands have the future is, you know, not what it used to be. That's what this is all about. Thank God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's what I say. Learning, innovation, collaboration, and relationships are now becoming more important than knowledge. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, uh, we can't hold all the knowledge we need to do our daily jobs in our head. We need to rely on each other's. We need to build our network. We need to build our ability to learn and get access to just-in-time information using all the tools at our disposal. Uh, as agile instructional designers, we need to focus on the essential and eliminate the expendable. We need to be able to adapt quickly to the changes in our environment, uh, network, and leverage the collective wisdom of everybody in the group, as well as all the experts that are out there. You guys living in Silicon Valley, you have an abundance of experts um, all around you. You need to actually welcome change. You know, change your mindset to not actually fear or kind of, you know, run from change, but actually say, cool, you know, this might not be real comfortable, but I'm going to do that and be prepared to be unprepared. So what can we learn from lean? Eliminate waste, amplify learning, decide as late as possible, deliver as fast as possible. The decide as late as possible is one we haven't talked about yet, and that's considered the last responsible moment. What happens, many of us, you know, in our quest for perfection, we want to get started real early, we want to kind of get an early start on things, but as things change, it's really, we're best in the best position to decide as close to the deadline as possible so that we can actually leverage the most knowledge about the product that we have to deliver because the customer might always be changing their priorities. So that's something we want to try and get comfortable with as well. Know what that is, but actually decide as late as possible. And the way that's called is the last responsible moment. We saw that tonight when Lance showed up like right on demand. That was a perfect <laughs> example. He was able to recover at the last responsible moment. You know, and that was just out of necessity, right? Deliver as fast as possible, empower the team, build integrity and quality in, see the whole end to end. It really helps to have a holistic way of thinking as designers. I call that zooming out, see the big picture, zoom in to see the individual piece you're working on, zoom out, zoom in. Kind of that's a skill that's really important. Um, and think that lumping it all together, it's think act, and a think big, act small, fail fast, and learn rapidly. Don't be afraid to fail. Because generally, it's in your failures that we as adults learn the most, right? It's like, oh, geez, I'm not going to do that again, right? And you have those profound aha moments of learning. Ideas, understand our customers, know how they measure value, um, precisely specify the value of any new product. Really make sure you work with your customers to understand what's their perception of value in that. How are they going to use it to make better decisions, to disrupt innovation on their Whatever it is, try and be as precise as you possibly can of measuring that and how, it will, and how you will know when it's done. That's another important thing you can learn from Agile, definition of done. We will be finished with this product when. What's the done product look like? So you push boundaries around it so you can manage the constraints that you're going to need to to actually deliver on this. Look for opportunities to experiment with thin slicing. We talked about that with your prototypes. You know, get stuff in front of them, even if it's paper prototypes. You know, um, identify the value streams for you creating each one of your products. Each one of you probably has different value streams. Continuously remove waste. Enable value to flow without interruptions. Limit your whip, work in progress, like we talked about every half an hour, every uh, morning, afternoon, whatever works for you. Um, but try to control your own interruptions. Let the customer pull value from the stream. That's when you'll know what's really important to the customer, is if they choose what's the next thing they want to work on, like the example we gave you. Uh, continuous learning and improvement, and blaze the trail by role modeling agile values and principles. Agile instructional designers increase ROI by making a continuous flow of value your focus. You deliver your reliable results by engaging customers in frequent interactions, as frequent as possible and shared ownership for the results, that's really important. Their skin needs to be in the game, your customers. Um, manage uncertainty through iterations, adapting, you know, and anticipating, doing risk assessment, finding patterns, like how often you have to fight fires, how often your teams are pulled, and find adaptive strategies. Unleash the creativity and innovation that recognizing that individuals 
are your ultimate source of value. It's about people, not the process. So give the process up in the spirit of enabling your people and creating an environment where every single person can do the best they can and make a real difference. Boost performance through group accountability. It's really important for everybody to be accountable for making their commitments in a, in a, in a, if you're working as a team, right? Um, and improve effectiveness and reliability through situationally specific improvements. Like you were sharing with how you handle fires. You know, situationally you're trying to make, make that better and better, but you're trying to boosting performance every step of the way. Cool. Um, you may be familiar with the growth mindset by Carol Dweck. If not, you might want to look at that and see how you might uh, incorporate that into your paradigm shifting. Um, and you'll get these slides. Um, so the fixed mindset is many of us have fixed mindsets where we really think everything is predictable. A growth mindset understands that you can't control everything and you have to actually adapt. Um, Again, these uh, mindset shift here is to embrace uncertainty and embrace change. Um, start. This is how I do my uh, design. I start with an empathy map. I build uh, learning stories. I let the learning emerge. And I have a very small shell of learning objectives and a backlog of learning stories in the classroom. I let the students pull what they need to learn. And so I adapt my learning environment with every single uh, scenario. Any of you are welcome to come to any of my Agile management classes at UC Berkeley on campus, one starting Saturday, um, to observe kind of how we do this. It's kind of mind-blowing, but it creates a learning experience that's unbelievable for the students. You know, I could tell you stories you would not believe. Um, so I start with an empathy map. Here's my Agile approach to learning instruction design. And uh, be prepared to be unprepared. Cool. Sorry it went, we missed the simulation, but um, hope this was valuable. Uh, and everybody will get a copy of the slides and I'll send the intel deck as well. Cool. Did you want to? Just want to say thanks to everybody. Please uh, give us your information card. Remember to take your name tag with you, but give us the holder. And October 16th is when uh, we'll have another meeting here.